Welcome back to our first fully in-person program of events. Uh, please can we ask you to keep your phones on silent. Uh, we are not expecting a fire alarm, so if the alarm sounds, please follow the instructions of our event stewards and make your way out of the building to the car park. If you would like to tweet about tonight's lecture, please use hashtag InsightsNCL. And following the lecture, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, and now I'll introduce uh, our speaker for today, Professor Sarah Ansari, uh, who's a historian of modern and contemporary South Asia based at Royal Holloway University of London. Uh, much of her research has focused on issues linked with migration, identity, citizenship, gender, and the 1947 partition of India, which she'll be talking to us about today. Um, her latest monograph, co-written with William Gould and enti uh, entitled Boundaries of Belonging, uh, came out of uh, from the Cambridge University Press in 2019. And it explores the intersections between localities, citizenship, and rights in India and Pakistan in the decade following independence. Sarah is also currently president of the Royal Asiatic Society, the first woman uh, to hold this role in the institution's 200-year uh, history. So I'll now pass on to Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. I hope everyone can hear me fine. It sounds like you can. Great. So the first thing I just want to do is thank the University of Newcastle for um, inviting me in the first place to come and speak. And I'd also like to thank the people who organised this event for making it such a, um, so, so smooth and easy to get here. Um, I'm very grateful also to everybody in the room who's taken time out to come to listen to my talk. Um, the title of my talk, in a sense, gives it all away in that um, what I'll be talking about, telling you about, is the partition of India as was, British India, that took place alongside independence 75 years ago. So 75 years ago means that this has been the 75th anniversary of those events, 2022. And I suspect that's why um, people here thought it might be an idea to get someone to come and talk about partition with you. So I've got slides. I've got my lecture. If I go wrong with the clicker, just be patient with me, um, and we'll take it from there. So I have just want to flag up that I called it an interconnected history. And I think that's just because I think for me and many other people who, who, who work on partition, um, see partition as being something that's very um, much part and parcel of British history along South Asian history. You know, our histories have long been connected, and there are reasons why perhaps partition is something that is particularly um, growing in recognition or possibly significance to people here in the UK. So let's see if I can make the clicker work. Yeah. So shortly before midnight on the 14th, 15th of August, Jawaharlal Nehru, then leader of the Indian National Congress, which was the main nationalist organisation in British India, rose in India's constituent assembly in New Delhi to deliver his famous Tryst with Destiny speech, a speech that marked and celebrated the end of 200 years plus, really, of British rule in South Asia. Um, Nehru's on the left there, the text, or at least an opening sort of set of um, words from the, from the speech is on the screen. But earlier the same day, with the last British Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, in attendance, the leader of the All India Muslim League, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, had addressed the recently created Pakistan Constituent Assembly in Karachi, Karachi being at that point Pakistan's new capital city, and he was delivering his own <coughs> message to the nation. So what these two speeches tell us is that the flip side, let's say, of South Asia achieving its independence, independence that had been long in the making, the Congress, Jawaharlal Nehru's party, having been established as far back as 1885, and the Muslim League, Jinnah's party, not much later in 1906. So the flip side of independence was partition, or the creation of two separate sovereign states, India and Pakistan, in August 1947. By any reckoning, the political implications of partition would have made it a significant event. 
not just significant from a South Asian perspective, but a global perspective. The subsequent politics of a region where roughly a quarter of the world's population live today have been directly shaped by it. But why partition proved to be a global event of extraordinary historical significance is because it triggered the largest single displacement of people or population displacement of the 20th century outside of, say, war and famine. So we're talking about, as I said, an event of immense global significance. Freedom from British rule came at enormous human cost. When thanks to this division, this partitioning of territory, many millions of refugees, we will never know the exact numbers, eventually crossed the new borders. And um, you see, in a sense, this captured in the map on the screen. They crossed the new borders. And in the process, huge numbers also lost their lives in extremely difficult circumstances. So if we had to sum up what happened at partition, we would probably use, or we might use words like confusion, uncertainty, panic, and an abdication of responsibility, really, on the part of the authorities to, um, let's say, help to smooth this transition. Now, I'm sure, again, that many of you will have heard mention of partition in recent months, thanks to that 75th anniversary that I um, mentioned before, and which did attract media attention over the summer. As with the 70th anniversary in 2017, there were television programs exploring how South Asia gained its independence from Brit British rule, though many of these, I think it should be said, were recycled from last time round. All the same, for many people in this country, it still came as a surprise, really, when they learnt more about what partition had entailed. To put it bluntly, and this is what I've been told over the last few months, um, they admitted to having had no idea of just how massive um, its human impact was and the extent of the upheavals involved. Nor had they appreciated um, the causes behind partition and its long-term human and political aftershocks. I think what is also significant is that many more people here, and by here I mean in the UK, are coming to recognise that partition is an integral part of British history too. For obvious reasons, such as the fact that so much of British history has literally taken place beyond these islands, and considering how much South Asia has been part of that history, I think partition does need to be acknowledged as a shared history, one that connects this country and the country and people of South Asia. And I'll come back to this point towards the end of my lecture. For now, I'll simply emphasize that decades later, partition still matters, because millions of people, both across and beyond South Asia, including in the UK, continue to be affected by its complex legacies. And it's in this context, really, that we see efforts taking place to raise broader awareness of what happened at partition, why partition happened, and what happened next. So that's really going to be the structure of my talk. The what happened, the why it happened, and the what happened next. So I'll start with the what happened. I think over the last year, um, we've become familiar with images. Um, I suppose like this one at the bottom left that helped to convey the enormity of the crisis involving Ukrainian refugees. If I take you back to the summer of 1947, then what we see are even larger numbers of refugees on the move. And these are some very familiar photographs. Anybody who studies partition, you know, students at university or wherever, you're going to see, probably have seen these photographs before. But these refugees on the move their displacement was directly linked to this partitioning of territory. Like the Ukraine, the 1947 partition has a backstory that can explain developments, which, like in Ukraine, seem to unfold very quickly. I should also add, just in passing, that the ongoing crisis in Pakistan, where flooding has directly affected over 30 million people, many of whom have been displaced from their homes, is arguably the biggest human challenge that this part of South Asia has faced in the last 75 years. And the images of people whose lives have been suddenly upended for no fault of their own are particularly reminiscent of the human suffering associated with partition. 
So the backstory to partition in 1947 was all about the ending of the British Empire in South Asia and how to transfer power to Indians. The UK had um, controlled India directly since the uprising of 1857 and parts of it indirectly for far longer. Britain was the so-called brightest jewel in the British imperial crown. By the 1940s, however, time was running out for or on empire or the Raj there, and pressure from mass nationalist organisations like the Indian National Congress was making it increasingly um, unrealistic and unreasonable, really, for the British or British control to continue indefinitely. Growing popular support for non-violent resistance or satyagraha, led by charismatic nationalist leaders like Gandhi in the 20s and 30s, meant that the British authorities were finding it increasingly hard to rule India. Indians wanted self-rule or Swaraj, and they wanted it sooner rather than later. And not all nationalists were con content to play by Gandhi's rules. Alongside his non-violent approach, there were other nationalist responses that posed more violent challenges to British rule. But either way, growing nationalist pressure alongside the UK's weakening global position raised a challenge. Namely, what kind of political arrangements would take the place of the Raj once British rule was ended? Hindus represented around, say, 70% of the population, so any future political arrangements would have to grapple with the implications of this numerical reality. How would minorities, some 30% of India's population, ensure that their voices would be heard under these circumstances? How would their interests be safeguarded? These were questions that were increasingly asked by leaders of those minority communities. And in due course, it became more and more difficult to identify a political way forward on which most Indians could agree, even if they all agreed on the importance of securing independence. So against an backdrop of apparent deadlock, um, it was decided, and this is um, very close to um, independence itself. It was decided in June 1947, so just a couple of months ahead of when independence and partition took place, that independence would take place just two months later, and that this would involve the creation of two independent states, not one. So in other words, alongside India, there would be Pakistan, a separate homeland for at least some of the subcontinent's Muslims. And it's this division that's known in English as partition, though for people in South Asia, other terms such as Batwara and Taksim are often what it is called. It then took another month um, or so before a committee, the Radcliffe Boundary Committee, was set up in Ju early July. So we're getting closer and closer to that, that, that date, set up in early July to decide exactly where the new dividing lines between the two states would run. So this all had to happen before the date now set for independence, namely 14th, 15th of August. And I've just put on the screen, I'm not going to read it out, but some 20 years later, the British poet W.H. Auden run, rat, um, wrote, I should say, an undoubtedly satirical but hard-hitting, really, poem that captured the confusion that existed at the time, pointing out just how um, little time and perhaps little knowledge was involved in this process of drawing up the new boundaries. Certainly, politicians and officials, let alone ordinary people, did not anticipate that mass movement on the scale that I've been talking about would be triggered. Indeed, very few people in the summer of 1947 fully understood what partition would in practice entail. It was all happening so quickly so very quickly. Um, as a Muslim student at Lucknow University, and Lucknow is in um, northern India in what is today Uttar Pradesh, but then was called the United Provinces, he um, later recalled, um, nobody then thought in terms of migration in those days, so ahead you know, of, of partition really kind of coming um, to, to the fore. Um, all, the Muslims all thought that everything would remain the same. Punjab would remain Punjab. Sindh would remain Sindh. There won't be any demographic changes, no drastic changes anyway. 
um, the Hindus and Sikhs would continue to live in Pakistan, and we, he was a Muslim, would continue to live in India. So this reminiscence made many years later under, underlines really the extent to which contemporaries were taken by surprise by these unfolding events. What further added to the confusion was that the new borders were not even revealed to the public until the 17th of August, so three days, or well, roughly three days after independence had taken place. The result of this increased or added uncertainty was to heighten tensions that were already high but grew worse and more violent um, over this period. So what we see is that in the weeks and months that straddled actually um, independence, um, they were marked by riots, um, mass, ca mass casualties, and those millions of people relocating to what they hoped would be safer territory. And they didn't necessarily expect this um, relocation to be a one-way journey. I mean, they were moving to somewhere that they thought would be safer in the short term. Whether they anticipated never returning to their ancestral homes is a whole different question. According to one Daily Mail correspondent, quote, train station platforms were packed with panic-stricken Hindu and Sikh refugees waiting despairingly for transport to India, while coming from the other direction, Muslim refugees from India, all with an utterly dazed air. Trains from Delhi to Lahore, with enough room for a thousand persons at least, arrived at their destination with battered survivors on board. As headlines in the Times of London stated towards the end of September, so a month or so after independence and partition had happened, four million on the move in northern India, minorities in a state of panic. A small partition boundary force um, had become operational on the 1st of August 47, but was disbanded only a month later because of its ineffectiveness in controlling the violence. And more broadly, troops remained confined to barracks the authorities concerned that they did not become the target, perhaps, of reprisals in the, in the process of maybe seeking to stem or staunch the violence. The armies of the two new dominions, India and Pakistan were dominions in the first instance, were now expected to take responsibility for the security of refugees on their respective sides of the border. Now, most of the people who were displaced, they walked or they travelled, you know, in oxen, drawn carts, there were walking columns or kafilas um, that reportedly stretched for over 50 miles in length. Others travelled by train and could be attacked en route. I mentioned that a moment ago, so-called ghost trains, which famously arrived at their destinations full of dead bodies. And they often feature this, these ghost trains, so to speak, in official records or oral testimonies and other kinds of writings about partition whether we're talking about fictional accounts or academic history books. A few lucky ones did fly. Either way, though, just to repeat, Hindus and Sikhs moved towards what was becoming India and Muslims in the direction of Pakistan. And as they traveled, they became targets of violent reprisals by members of the opposing side, out for revenge or whatever, each blaming basically the other um, for unwanted upheavals in their lives and for what was being lost what they felt was being lost. I just want to put a quote up. It's quite a long one. I don't think I should really um, read it out. But I, I want to just draw your attention to this quote. It was written by a leading um, writer. You can see her on the right-hand side of the screen. Her name was Ismat Chuktai, who, incidentally, though she was a Muslim, did not move from India or Hindustan, as she calls it, in this particular extract. Um, she didn't move to Pakistan in 1947. Um, I'll, just, I'll just quote the very last sentence in this, in this extract. She, she refers to the bonds of human relationship being in tatters, and in the end, many souls remained behind in Hindustan while their bodies set off for India, I mean, for Pakistan, rather. So you get a sense of that kind of loss and later on the nostalgia, perhaps, that, that marked the partition experience. But no one can say for, for certain how many people were displaced in the longer run. Um, historians, we just can't put our finger on an accurate figure. Probably around 14 to 16 million people in the longer run. Later censuses that were held in both India and Pakistan in the, at the start of the 1950s support this kind of total. What is indisputable, however, is that, the, uh, as I've already flagged up, 
partition-related migration represented the largest population displacement anywhere in the 20th century world outside war and famine. I think something that, um, and that we, is, is important to flag up is that there was also a, a gender dimension to this crisis. Um, women from all communities were targeted for reprisal thanks to how they were regarded as embodying the honour of their communities. Um, there were even incidents when women were, could be killed by relatives to protect that honour or took their own lives to safeguard family honour. And hence, India's first Prime Minister, who I mentioned earlier, Jawaharlal Nehru, described women as, quote, partition's chief sufferers. Indeed, in the aftermath of partition, the two new governments of India and Pakistan worked together, actually, to rescue so-called abducted women and return them to their birth families. However, we should note that this was irrespective of what those women might themselves have wanted at the time. So there could be, in a sense, the forcible repatriation of these abducted women. It wasn't a straightforward, a straightforward process. So I'll just, um, well, again, there's a quote here on the screen from one of the, um, I suppose, leading female so-called social workers um, from India, um, Sarabhai, who was involved in these recovery um, operations. Uh, and, and what we do see is that women, both from Pakistan, as it had become, and from India, were involved in this very important initiative or efforts in the months following partition. There's a later account provided by another one of these women, this time Anis Kidwai, uh, a woman who'd lost her own husband to communal violence in October 1947, because the violence didn't just stop you know, immediately after independence and partition. It carried on for weeks, months afterwards. She went on later to become a member of the upper house of the Indian parliament between 1956 and 68. And in her memoirs that you can see that I have included up on the right-hand side of the screen, um, the English title is In Freedom's Shad Shade or Shadow, the effort to re rescue abducted women had become very, or had begun, I should say, very late. And it wasn't that automatically the case that the authorities were, ve were very helpful when it came to this. Um, but she does give us some figures down at the bottom of um, the number of women involved. By, I suppose, 1954, which was when this sort of recovery operation um, ended, something like 17,000 women had been rescued from Pakistan, sent over to India, and about 20,000 women rescued and moved in the other direction. The specific case of women aside, inevitably huge refugee camps sprang up, and refugee rehabilitation posed enormous challenges for years to come. And India and Pakistan spent years discussing, but not being able to agree on effective ways of compensating refugees for property that they'd been forced to leave behind. So in a sense, this is what happened. But now I want to just talk a little bit about why did it happen, because we need to understand why partition took place. And I think I'll just give you, I suppose, three main um, things to think about. The first, really, is that partition was very, very closely bound up with how religious identity had become politicised under British rule, so-called divide and rule. And while this may seem like a rather simple way of describing what was a very complex process, its starkness does capture the divisive impact of British policies on Indian society. So as a consequence, a number or growing number of Indian Muslims came to feel that the Congress, the main nationalist organisation that I mentioned earlier, did not represent their interests, or they couldn't be certain that it would represent their interests moving forward. And under these circumstances, they turned to the Muslim League led by Jinnah. Ironically, um, back around the time of the First World War, Jinnah was actually credited with being the architect, he was known as the architect of Hindu-Muslim unity. But in due course, he became one of Congress's biggest critics. Members of other minority communities also had worries about living in a future state that would be inevitably dominated by its majority community. Second, and I suppose more immediately or closer to um, 
actual independence and partition, we need to factor in the impact of the Second World War and how it acted as a catalyst for political change. Um, Congress, for instance, launched its last big mass campaign, protest campaign, the Quit India Movement in 1942, you know, right in the middle of the war, demanding immediate independence in return for support for the war effort. As a result, key nationalist leaders like Gandhi, like Nehru, were incarcerated until 1944 and 45, respectively. Faced with Congress opposition, the British authorities turned to other interest groups to cooperate. And in return, those other interest groups were promised that their views would be considered when future political arrangements came to be decided. And one of those interest groups was the Muslim League, a party that claimed to represent Indian Muslims, even if it only ever spoke for a proportion of them. And it sought, I suppose, safeguards to protect what it regarded as Muslim interests. By the early 1940s, its leader, Jinnah, was deploying, albeit rather vaguely, the idea of this sort of separate, in inverted commas, Pakistan um, for Indian Muslims as a part of his attempt to secure those future concessions that for a long time Congress wasn't prepared to accept. So initially, the, the League's um, Lahore Resolution of 1940, which was started to kind of put this demand on the table, um, talked about states in the plural, not one single state for Indian Muslims, but states in the plural. But this hardened, really, into one possible state as the war progressed. And stalemate, as I've indicated earlier, ensued with mounting tensions between those different religious um, interest groups that increasingly spilt over into communal violence, which in turn then um, increased pressure to find a political solution sooner rather than later. So it's a little bit like, you know, pressure cooker over that last um, period of the war and then into the immediate post-war period, building up and building up its, its, its head of steam and something was going to explode. Um, thir thirdly, really, the Second World War also had a huge impact on the UK's own ability to continue controlling India. Apart from pressure from its ally, the US, the new Labour government, elected in 1945, was committed to a whole raft of reforms at home, including setting up the welfare state, and all this cost money. Hence, the UK simply did not have the resources to hold India by force. Remaining British troops who had been stationed in India during the war just wanted to get home once the conflict was over. And while worryingly for the authorities, there was even a mutiny in the Indian Navy in 1946. A high-powered um, commission, the, the cabinet mission, was sent out from London in 1946. At one point, it looked like maybe it could secure agreement for a united India, but ultimately its proposals failed, um, largely thanks to Congress mis misgivings about the proposed federal arrangements that it included. And one of the, I suppose, results of this was um, a very big outbreak of violence in Calcutta in the summer of 1946. And this seemed to sort of light almost the, um, the fuse. And, and from August 46, the violence spread <coughs> up the Ganges Valley to the northwest of the subcontinent. And um, tensions rose even further. So by early 1947, British strategy had changed to one that involved leaving the subcontinent as soon as possible. It was now a question of when and how and not whether to hand over power to Indians. But there's still that problem of how the Congress and the League are going to come to, I suppose, or reach an agreement over future power sharing arrangements. And that proved obviously much easier said than done. Um, early in 1947, an act of parliament over here in Britain, proposed June 48 as the deadline for that transfer of power to Indian hands. But early in 47, that date was brought forward, brought forward to August 47, brought forward a very short notice by the last Viceroy, Lord Louis Mountbatten, who'd arrived in New Delhi in March 47, with a mandate really to find a speedy way of bringing the Raj to its conclusion. But the fact that in the space of only five months, he decided to shorten the timetable by 10 months provides us with that indication of just how rapidly events were moving by this stage. 
Following his arrival in India, Mountbatten met with all the major party leaders, encounters that we can read about in his collected diaries. And I think it's quite evident from these accounts that Mountbatten really did see himself as the man of the moment, the skilled negotiator in his eyes, who would bring an honourable and advantageous end to British power in India. It was also the case that he had a closer relationship with Congress leaders, and Nehru in particular, than he did with Jinnah. Hence, it's now generally accepted um, that by sharing more information about British thinking um, with Nehru and his Congress colleagues through the months of April, May 47, Mountbatten effectively allowed the Congress to dominate the terms of negotiation. And by this time, the strategy of the Congress and the British was already beginning to coincide quite closely, um, and it included the need for a rapid resolution of independence before the drafting of a constitution um, which both accepted should take place after the British has left. So constitution was really going to be sorted out post-independence rather than pre-independence. And in return, the Congress would agree to India remaining within the Commonwealth. The main sticking point, however, remained how to accommodate minority concerns about future political arrangements. Eventually, Mountbatten decided that the, quote, way to get the job done was to present Indians with a fait accompli, and this, in this way to force a compromise, you know, force them to agree on a compromise um, solution. Hence that announcement in early June, 3rd of June, 47, that one way or another, independence would take place just a couple of months later. By setting out such a tight deadline, the only effective way out of the dilemma was a two-state solution. Partition thus formed the basis of the agreement, the means to the end. But Mountbatten on the part of the authorities added a further twist by also insisting that two key Muslim majority provinces, i.e. provinces within British India which had slight Muslim majorities in terms of their populations, he insisted that the two key Muslim majority states, provinces rather, of the Punjab and Bengal would also have to be divided between the two new states. Since allowing both to be part of Pakistan in their existing form would be unacceptable um, to the majority, to Congress. Jinnah was very happy, unhappy I should say, to accept what he called a truncated or mutilated and moth-eaten Pakistan. But eventually he too capitulated and agreed to that 3rd of June plan as did the provincial legislative assemblies in both Bengal and the Punjab. They kind of gave it the stamp of approval too. And in effect, the die was cast. And then again, we're, we're into that sort of situation where people are on the move um, in very desperate circumstances. So I've talked about what happened. I've talked about or at least touched on why it happened. So I'll just come to the sort of third part of my lecture, which is what happened next. Why does the story of partition still matter 75 years later, 75 years after the, you know, the creating of two separate states, India and Pakistan, at independence? And again, I suppose I would offer three main reasons. I mean, there are many reasons, but for the purposes of today, I'll give you sort of three main reasons. First, um, yeah, first partition meant that the relationship between India and Pakistan started badly, and the two countries have had poor relations ever since. So, you know, the, the geopolitics of the region, you know, badly scarred by the impact of how independence took place, by how or why partition turned out the way that it did. And India and Pakistan, as I'm sure many of you will appreciate, have subsequently fought um, a number of hot and cold wars. Um, the first one breaking out over the future of the princely state of Kashmir, um, just months after independence. And the fact that both states now possess nuclear weapons alongside some of the largest <coughs> armies in the world, you know, the Indian and Pakistani armies are huge, has added further instability into the mix. So security in South Asia is still directly affected by a legacy, we could say, of bitterness and political uncertainty that we can trace back, um, not wholly, but in large part at least, to partition those circumstances of the summer of 1947. 
And I think second par partition is also responsible for having made the lives of minorities in both countries very precarious. Um, don't forget that only a proportion of Indian Muslims ended up in what was then becoming Pakistan. Obviously, Pakistan itself later split with the eastern wing of East Pakistan becoming Bangladesh in 1971. India and Pakistan continued to contain minority communities, therefore, but in, the view of, in view of the mutual suspicions, let's say, involved, these minority communities have often been labelled as potential enemies within, suspect citizens whose loyalties to the state, to the nation, cannot be guaranteed, and religious-based violence, communal violence, um, has continued to blight the subcontinent since 1947 at particular moments in that 75-year span of history. So those are two reasons. I think, you know, if you're interested in South Asia today and, you've, and, and you're, you sort of follow the politics, then in, in a number of ways, what we see today is linked to um, 75 years ago. But thirdly, I suppose, why should um, partition matter here in the UK? Um, well, I, I, well, for a start, I would argue that partition you know, is very much part and parcel of this country's history. I indicated that at the start of the lecture. Um, South Asia's independence marked the beginning of the end, apart from anything else, of the British Empire, something with which we are still grappling politically today. So partition is the flip side, that word I use, the flip side to independence, represents a very important episode in the wider story of the UK's post-Second World War decline, really, as an imperial power. Moreover, the UK today is home to over 3 million people of South Asian heritage. And since many of their forebears came originally from the Punjab or Bengal, the two provinces that were most affected by the violent upheavals of 1947, um, then most, if not all, their families have been or were touched to some degree by the impact of and the fallout from partition. Their histories or the histories of these communities, these, these um, people of South Asian heritage, didn't start at ground zero when their forebears migrated to this country. After all, people bring their history with them when they move. Moreover, if we want to properly understand the individual experiences that encourage people from India and Pakistan, and then later what becomes Bangladesh, to migrate to the UK in the decades after the Second World War, we've also got to recognise the knock-on destabilising impact of partition. Once people have been uprooted once from their ancestral homes, history shows us that it is much more likely that they will move again. But at the same time, like their counterparts who remained in South Asia, many of these partition survivors, as they come to be known, in its aftermath chose silence, chose not to speak about it, not to share their memories of their experiences. Because of the painful realities of what had happened to people caught up in the violence of partition, violence that we should note implicated all communities, um, partition tended not to be talked about much, if at all, until maybe the last couple of decades or so of, um, well, maybe last 20, 30 years. Historians may have written about it, but for many ordinary people, their own pay painful experiences were rarely discussed. Instead, they chose, understandably, maybe, to focus on the future, even if it meant sort of suppressing the past. But over the last few decades, in recent years, Talk about partition has increased substantially. Very often, partition survivors have been encouraged to open up, to share their memories by younger family members keen to understand how they themselves connect with it. And much of the push for this process of, let's call it collective remembering, has come from within South Asian diasporic communities now scattered around the world. Interestingly, particularly among these diaspora South Asian communities, partition has often been used as a way of highlighting shared experiences rather than as a divisive event that we might assume it might be. After all, while so much emphasis has tended perhaps understandably to focus on the scale of the violence, the loss involved, there were also 
many instances of members of different communities helping others. And we often now hear tales of how people would entrust, say, homes or property to neighbours from other communities in the expectation that once things had calmed down, perhaps they would be back to resume life as before. And we also hear of people putting their own lives at risk to save the lives of others. All the same, it's not easy to overcome decades of entrenched, arguably state-sponsored sus suspicion from both within and beyond South Asia. <coughs> um, the communal tension spilling over into violence that recently took place in Leicester highlights just how challenging this remains. Ostensibly triggered by the outcome of cricket matches between India and Pakistan and undoubtedly affected by the religion-based nationalism that's on the rise in different parts of South Asia, it's still not hard to connect the present day friction between India and Pakistan to the circumstances of their creation back in 1947 and the direct but very difficult political legacies that these generated. Just go back a couple of slides. Just want to bring up the one that has the picture on the right. Interestingly, the annual South Asia Heritage Month, which runs from the 18th of July to the 17th of August, that's grown massively since it was set up in the UK in 2020, so in a sense at the height of COVID, but by, fat, by people whose families had been directly affected by partition. It schedules its um, start and finish dates to highlight the fact that it was on the 17th of August, as I mentioned previously, that the boundaries of the new borders to highlight um, between India and Pakistan were announced. And South Asia Heritage Month grew directly out of efforts to make partition better understood in this country. And here I would also mention two examples of the Partition History Project that um, was connected to the 70th anniversary and its successor initiative, the Partition Education Group, which have been working with school teachers to empower them really to, to teach this very difficult history. And partition as, whoops, let's bring up the other slide, as perhaps some of these other images um, remind us, has also made its way somewhat into the popular media from providing the storyline in a, there it is, Doctor Who episode um, back in 2018 to hitting the more recent headlines courtesy of the Disney Plus um, Miss Marvel series. So, you know, partition, which would never have featured in anything like this, I would suggest 10 years ago, is starting to be something that, uh, if nothing else, screenwriters and filmmakers feel is sufficiently known for people to be able to um, engage with, with these kinds of storylines. So, so this is it, really. I hope I've kept more or less to time. Um, I want to just conclude my talk with just one last point, really, um, which is that as these Closer to Home initiatives highlight, and despite the undoubted challenges involved, there are now efforts underway to make sure that we do not forget about partition here. As with other difficult histories, though, how to take a divisive, highly emotionally charged moment in history and repurpose it, let's say, in thoughtful and inclusive ways lies at the heart of the challenge. But for all the complexities involved in remembering partition, in acknowledging its sort of place in history and why it matters, events like those in Leicester that I mentioned a moment ago reinforce the importance of using shared histories to bring communities together, to sort of flip those histories so that they can actually um, help us to achieve something positive as opposed to reinforcing negativities. And as the 1922 um, um, 75th anniversaries reminded us, partition, I think, offers us here in the UK a starting point for telling honest but ultimately inclusive stories about, say, the end of empire and its aftermath, ones or stories that connect people and places both in the present but in the past as well. And so because of that, for me at least, and I think a lot of other historians of South Asia who work on the period in which partition took place, um, partition is very much a connected history. It connects not just India and Pakistan and Bangladesh, but it connects the South Asia with the UK. And it's a connected history that spans continents and countries alike.
So I'll stop at this point and just leaving those thoughts on the board behind me from a contemporary who um, perhaps reminds us of just you know, where or how shared humanity um, or how important a shared humanity is to all of us. So thank you very much.